if you can't quite stretch to the cost of a new generation hot hatch, then do not despair because you can get one of these little monsters for a fraction of the price. And my pick of the bunch are the Golf R32, the Renault Sport Megane, and the BMW 1 Series 130i. First up, it's a Volkswagen Golf. And it's one that some might say is the best of the breed. And not even a GTI. This is one of the fastest, most powerful Golfs ever produced. The R32 has a 3.2 litre V6 hidden beneath its redesigned bonnet. It'll do 62 miles an hour in six seconds and go on to 155. <laughs> VW have form here. When they launched the Golf GTI back in 1975, they essentially invented the modern hot hatch. So if you do buy this car, you are buying into hot hatch royalty. And buy in you should, because you can pick one of these up super cheap. £5,000. Yes, £5,000 for that mighty engine, four-wheel drive and a family wagon. It is an intoxicating hot hatch that is potent and incredibly agile. Great grip. I know, you're waiting to hear the downside. At 13 years old, things can go a bit wrong. Watch out for rusty wings and, if possible, get one that's had its timing chain done. Also, if you're looking at a model with the DSG Auto gearbox fitted, check your paperwork for gearbox oil change intervals being hit. If they haven't been, then you could have a lumpy pull away from stationary when it's hot, which is a very bad sign and will cost you about five grand to replace. Another thing to look out for on a Mark V R32 are seized rear calipers. Replacement is the only real solution. If you can get reconditioned calipers, they'll cost you about £100 per side plus labour. From hot hatch royalty to an upstart in the game, the BMW 1 Series 130i M Sport. <laughs> We know that BMW make hot M cars, but sadly not on our budget. So perhaps this is the next best thing. BMW's M Sport range offers a way to enjoy some of the sports trim found on their full fat M cars, but at a much more affordable price. It'll cost you about six and a half thousand pounds. And for that, you get a car that you can use every day. The naturally aspirated 265 brake horsepower engine will hit 62 in around six seconds. And because there isn't a huge amount of weight at the back, you can have a lot of fun very quickly. And should you run out of talent, BMW's multi-layered traction control system is there to help you out. At low speed, the gear changes can be a little bit clunky, but the overwhelming thing is how dull the cockpit is. There's no thrills and certainly no spills in here. So forget about this interior and just enjoy the chassis, the engine. Because this is a good car, a really good car. So if you want one, what should you look out for when you're car shopping? Lifting the bonnet before you buy is essential. Look for any oil leaks from the oil filter or cylinder head housing. Changing them will cost you around £300. And the ignition coil packs are liable to go down occasionally. It will cost you roughly £250 plus VAT to change all six. But don't let potential running costs put you off. What an opportunity to buy a bit of stealth M-Power for silly money. Silly cheap. Now for my final choice. How about a bit of French fancy with this, the Renault Sport Megane 275 Trophy. 17,000 pounds worth of hot, hot hatch. Yes, that's a good deal more than the other hot hatches I'm driving today, but this car is only a few years old and was 29,000 pounds when new the terrifically tuned suspension with a two-litre, four-cylinder turbocharged engine powering the front wheels. So it's a totally different drive to the four-wheel drive Golf and the rear-wheel drive BMW. 
The mighty McGann's are incredibly sure-footed, so much so that you won't want to see a straight piece of tarmac again. Unless, of course, you want to do a 0-62 dash, in which case the RS275 will do it in under six. Beware, though, for common issues that these powerful McGann's suffer from. The front wheel bearings suffer from a lot of loading and stress and can fail. Listen out for a squeaking noise. It's an indicator that they'll need changing at a cost of about £250 per side. Suspension knocks are common too. And before you hand over your hard-earned cash, make sure that the engine hasn't been remapped, or if it has been, that a Renault specialist did it. If not, walk away. Serious engine issues lie in wait for a badly mapped Megane. So there you have it, three very different hot hatches, all with their own quirky features. But if I had to take one of these bad boys home... They all have their merits, but for me, I'm going to go for the BMW. Despite that drab interior, it feels like a baby M3. If you were here at the start of the show, and I sincerely hope you were, you'll know that Jason and Karun are currently putting the best 50 grand sports cars to the test. Not everyone has that sort of cash, though. So, what if I said you could buy the exact same badges on near-identical cars, but for a fraction of the price? Yes, these incredible sports cars can now be on your drive with prices starting at just £8,000. Let me introduce them. The BMW Z4. The Porsche Cayman. And finally, the Audi TT RS. I'll begin with the cheapest. This second generation Z4 came out in 2009 and was initially launched with two engines, a 2.5 or a 3 litre. This 2011 model has got the 2.5 and its six cylinders produce 204 horsepower that'll get you to 62 in a shade over six and a half seconds. However, the top of the range 3 litre has 306 horsepower and does the same dash in 5.2 seconds, so that's the one I go for. If keeping up with the Joneses is important to you, then it's worth bearing in mind that of the three cars I'm driving today, this is the newest. In fact, the Mark III Z4 has only just been launched. And then there's the price. Yes, you can now get one of these snappy-looking machines for just £8,000. But is it any good to drive? Underneath me is a really, really good chassis. And the steering has plenty of feedback. And you can place the car wherever you want it to. But it hasn't got that pin-sharp, agile and thoroughbred stuff that you can get in some sports cars. It's like a sports car that's been wrapped up in a duvet. But it's fun for it still. In an effort to make the Z4 more comfortable, they replaced the Mark 1's fabric roof with a folding metal one. This might have resulted in a quieter car, but it added 180 kilos. In fact, it is the same as the weight of two male adult kangaroos. Thank you, Google. We've established that the Z4 is cheap to buy, but is it cheap to maintain? The answer to that is yes. Parts are relatively inexpensive, and apart from the usual servicing, only two things will cause you concern. The coil packs can fail, which usually causes a misfire, and £250 to depart from your wallet for a replacement. And the cylinder head housing gasket can sometimes leak, which will set you back £300. Other than that, pretty trouble-free motoring. Next up the price list, the Porsche Cayman S. Cayman. One word that strikes fear into pretty much every other manufacturer, because when this car was launched in 2006, it dominated the market and it has done ever since. And now early examples have reached really affordable levels. You can now get your hands on a decent early Cayman without stratospheric mileage for around £12,000. And that doesn't buy you the entry-level 2.7-litre version, but this 2006 3.4S. Woohoo! At just over 1,400 kilograms, this is the lightest of our three. And with 299 horsepower, it'll reach 62 in 5.4 seconds. Is 299 horsepower enough? 
<laughs> Never for me. And although it works brilliantly in this car, the Cayman has got such a capable chassis that it could cope with a lot more. And then there's the sound. <laughs> on the throttle and your senses come alive. The car is ready, willing and very, very able. However, Porsche ownership isn't always a grin a minute. Now, I don't wish to be a bore, but the cylinder bores can get scored and this can be a big problem for Cayman owners. Warning signs are a sooty exhaust and a tapping sound, usually from one side of the engine. If your worst fears are realised, you're looking at a new engine. Cost? £8,000, which is the total cost of the price of the Z4 I've been driving. The other common fault could stop you from keeping a cool head. The radiator and aircon condenser are at the front of the car and are prone to corrosion. A spicy smell from the bumper is a warning sign that all is not well and £800 will be needed to fix it. A mere trifle in Porsche ownership land, as well I know. On to my final car. The Mark II Audi TT was launched in 2006, but it will be another three years before the range-topping RS showed itself. When new, this TT RS would have cost nearly £50,000, but now a 2011 model could be on your drive for just 18000 340 horsepower from a 2.5-litre, five-cylinder turbocharged engine. <laughs> With a very grippy four-wheel drive system, it'll hit 62 in 4.7 seconds. <laughs> Which makes it comfortably the fastest machine of our three. The engine in this car is absolutely epic, and so are the levels of grip. And ten years on, there's not a whole lot that can keep up with it. So, what to look out for? Well, you'd think 340 horsepower would be enough, but it seems many RS owners want more. So they have tuned the engine to produce over 400 horsepower. The tuning is cheap, but your insurance will be crucified. The RS also needs servicing twice as often as other TTs. Oh, and the glove box hinge can snap. A tiny part, but a bill that will cost £300 plus. So, after a day with these cars, which one would I have? It is very close because they are all such fun, but the one I would take home is the Cayman because its handling is so engrossing. Yes, each of these could be on your drive for between £5,000 and £12,000. Let me introduce them. Nissan Leaf Series 1. The Vauxhall Ampera. And finally, the BMW i3. The Nissan Leaf is one of the best-known electric cars and it is the best-selling badge to date. It won the European Car of the Year when it was launched in 2011 and it was hailed for putting electric cars on a par with conventional cars, in some respects at least. A new Nissan Leaf will set you back nearly 30 grand, but now you can get into a Series 1 like this for just 5 grand. With that in mind, Nissan claims this car can do up to 100 miles between charges, but sometimes the reality can be rather different. Various factors can alter the range, such as driving style and weather conditions. While the range was 100 miles when new, it's likely to be lower now, as time and usage means batteries lose some of their capacity. It's powered by an electric motor with 107 horsepower and 210 pound-foot of torque, driving the front wheels. It's also got a 24 kilowatt lithium-ion battery that's in the floor and comes with a warranty of 100,000 miles or eight years, whichever comes soonest. But is the Leaf any fun to drive? The best thing about electric cars is the fact that as soon as you put your foot on the throttle, boom, you get all the torque instantly. So you can shoot off more quickly than you could in most petrol or diesel cars. However, saying that, this car's knock to 60 time of nine seconds isn't that blistering, but it does feel like you're being propelled down the road pretty quickly. When it comes to maintaining an EV, what is there to look out for? 
Well, of course, there's no need to change the oil, the spark plugs or the air filters, but the biggest concern with electric cars is the battery capacity. The battery pack of the LEAF is expected to retain 70 to 80% of its capacity after 10 years, but as with range, its actual lifespan depends on how often fast charging is used, driving patterns and environmental factors such as temperature. It is rare that a battery will fail with this model, but if it does, you could expect to pay up to £5,000 for a replacement, which is a lot when the car costs £5,000. The software system on the LEAF can be a bit finickety, particularly if it's not updated regularly, and it can give false information. So, for example, you could be driving to a charging point that no longer exists. So, best keep it updated. Next up, it's the Vauxhall Ampera. It was the first plug-in hybrid to go on sale in the UK back in 2012. It has a 50-mile range on pure electric power, and then it's got a petrol engine which works as a generator, and that will give you an extra 300 miles. So there is a zero range anxiety here. The petrol engine works as a generator for the battery pack. It's what's called a range extender, so perhaps a good stepping stone for nervous converts. The electric motor has 149 horsepower, which gets the Ampera from 0 to 62 in nine seconds. When it comes to handling, it's pretty similar to the Leaf. It feels like a bigger car, and the steering is slightly better tuned to my taste. The 0 to 60 time happens in the same time as the Leaf at nine seconds. And when I lift my foot off the throttle, the car automatically slows down without me having to put my foot onto the brake. That's called regenerative braking and the power that that generates then goes back into the system to help me go forwards again. The interior of the Ampera still feels reasonably fresh and in the boot there's a pretty decent amount of space and the back seats fold forward. However, it is a strict four-seater and that's because of the way the batteries are laid out under the floor. When it was new, this car was £34,000. Today you can pick one up for around £12,000. But with such a complicated petrol and battery powertrain, there are some issues to look out for. Should you need to replace the 16 kilowatt battery, then the price will be around £10,000, which includes labour and VAT. And transmission solenoids, which control the fluids in the gearbox, have been known to fail and cost between £150 to £300 to replace. And my final choice is an EV with a premium badge, the BMW i3. And this version, like the Ampera, has a range extended petrol engine, which gets the i3 to 60 in 7.9 seconds. Despite being launched over five years ago, this car still wouldn't look out of place if it was launched at a motor show today. It is sensational. As well as cutting edge looks, the passenger cell is made of high tech carbon fibre, which is usually reserved for supercars, and it gives a weight saving of around a quarter of a tonne. Every other manufacturer should come and have a look at the i3's interior. It has so many different things to see, to touch. It keeps my interest. It's got different fabrics, different tones. It is awesome. I love being in here. It's definitely sprightly when you put your foot down. It's the better handling of our three cars. With a price tag of around 12 grand, is the investment worth it? Or will its upkeep cost even more? There have been issues with the i3's air conditioning system. If you have a faulty one, it needs to be replaced immediately because it also cools the batteries. A replacement one will cost about £1,800. And if you hear a squeak in your steering wheel, it could be the front swivel joints. Cost of repair would be around £400 to £500. So, after a day with these cars, which would I have? The electric appeal of these three cars is their excellent acceleration. But for me, I like a car that's engaging to drive and to be in. And so it is the BMW i3. Earlier in the show, Jason and Tiff were having some fun in a couple of US muscle cars. Good value they may be. However, each will set you back around £40,000. What have I said? You could buy into the American dream for £10,000. All these vehicles have been privately imported and each now costs a quarter of the price of the new cars. The Ford Mustang. The Pontiac Firebird Trans Am. And the Chevrolet Corvette C5. 
total, we have over 800 of the finest American horsepowers. Yeah! Right then, let's get going. If you're going to look at American muscle cars, or American cars in general, for that matter, then you cannot ignore the iconic Ford Mustang. This fifth generation Stang was made from 2005 to 2014, and I've got the 210 horsepower V6. It'll hit 62 miles an hour in 6.4 seconds, which is phenomenally quick for something so big, and it goes on to a very respectable 159 miles an hour. You can get more impressive speeds if you go for the V8, but I'm very happy today with the V6. And another advantage of the smaller engine is fuel consumption, which can approach 30 mpg if driven carefully. There's a bit of blobbiness about it, but that's all part of the experience and part of the fun. So, if you fancy one of these cars, what must you look out for? The fuel level sending unit can get covered with sulphur compounds from petrol and cause inaccurate fuel gauge readings. So make sure that the one you're buying has got a correct fuel gauge because a new one will instantly cost you £80 to replace. And the rubber seals around the doors, bonnet and boot are prone to coming loose. Along with most other parts on the Mustang, these are cheap to replace. However, ignore them and you'll get some embarrassing damp patches that could lead to rust. Next, the Pontiac. Launched in 1993, this fourth version of Pontiac's venerable Trans Am packed 275 horsepower from its 5.7 litre V8. 0-62 came up in 6.2 seconds, which is fractionally quicker than the Mustang, and it went on to 160 miles an hour. <laughs> Even for me, this is a tad too noisy. Needless to say, this is not a standard exhaust system. This is more of a sports car than the Mustang. The suspension is firmer and the body roll is much better controlled here. The seats are incredibly comfortable. I honestly feel as if I've slipped into a whopping great big armchair. One to Trans Am, then keep an eye out for the following. The engine should be pretty solid. And here's a good tip for you to check. When it's hot, the oil pressure should be between 40 and 60 PSI. If it isn't, and there's some blue smoke coming out of the exhaust, then walk away, because you're looking at an engine rebuild pretty soon. Firebird gearboxes are strong, but limited slip diffs aren't. So if you hear a whining sound, then it means that yours is due for an overhaul. Parts are readily available, and they're not too expensive. And finally, the C5 Corvette, which was launched in 1997. Our first two are poster cars of American muscle machines. But there is one car that is considered by many to be America's finest sports car. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you the Corvette. With 345 brake horsepower, the Chevrolet's engine is more powerful than the other two. Yet, this car weighs the same, so it's 0 to 62 mile an hour time, comes up in 5.5 seconds, and it'll go on to 172. So, what to look out for? Well, with the car sitting so low to the ground, the front air dam on the fifth generation Corvette is known to take some punishment, and General Motors acknowledges this. They call the air dam a wear part, something that wears reasonably quickly. A replacement will cost you £100, and don't forget to wait for the time it takes to come across the Atlantic. And being a very sporty muscle car, the Corvette has a reputation for suffering body damage generally, so check there's no mismatch in paint colours or other signs of repair. The combined cost of these cars when new, including shipping, was around £90,000. Today you can have them for £30,000, and that is what I call muscle cars on a budget. Which one would I choose? It would absolutely depend on my mood. If I was feeling stylish, I'd go for the Ford. If I wanted performance, I'd take the Corvette, and if I wanted fun, I'd have the Pontiac. It really is a three-way tie, a fifth gear first. Earlier in the show, you'll have seen Johnny and I putting a couple of luxury sporty 4x4s through their paces to find out which is best. But you don't necessarily have to spend big bucks to own a big SUV. All of these offer seven seats, they give you a grand view and can now be yours for under £7,000. The Volvo XC90. 
the Land Rover Discovery 3, and the Audi Q7. They're all cracking motors, but they're also all diesels, so bear in mind the proposed emission zone charges Jason mentioned earlier. I'll start with something Swedish. Of the three cars here, the Volvo is the oldest. It's been around since 2002. Consequently, very early high mileage models can be had for about two and a half thousand pounds. But if you want something fresher, then seven thousand pounds will buy you a car that's about 10 years old with reasonable mileage. Over its 12-year production run, this first-generation XC90 was fitted with numerous engines. However, the 2.4 diesel was the most common and the most economical. Volvos of this era were not renowned to be particularly sporty, not least a 4x4 like this. So don't expect the drive of your life, but I could happily do many miles in this machine. Like the others, it's got permanent four-wheel drive. And what's really clever is the way this car is packaged. It is big, yes, but it feels quite narrow and it's not unwieldy in any way. Used as a five-seater, the XC90 has a huge boot, but cram in two more people and be prepared to compromise on luggage. Plus, the extra seats are quite cramped, so it becomes more of a day-trip machine. Don't forget, this is a seven-seater family car and will have been through the rigors of family life. So try and look for one that's as pristine as you can possibly find. So if you fancy an XC90 on your drive, what must you look out for? As you might expect, these cars are generally very reliable. But if there is a start-up issue in cold weather, it could mean that the injectors are on their way out and that's a £1,500 fix. And finally, you can get stung on road tax. Check the CO2 figure of the exact model that you're buying because the size of the wheels alone could push the price up from £300 to £500 a year. Bonkers. Next, the Land Rover. When the third generation Discovery broke cover in 2004, it was a world away from the previous two machines. You either loved its brutal slab-sided looks or you didn't. I did and still do. £7,000 will get you into a decent spec diesel with around 100,000 miles on the clock. And I really would recommend a diesel because this weighs two and a half tonnes and shifting that amount of weight with a petrol engine will cost money. As it is, you'll be lucky to get 30 mpg. Because this is a Land Rover, it has off-road capabilities that the other two can only dream about. Down here is a host of settings. Snow, sand, the north face of the Eiger. Whatever you need, just in case you might want to go there. But of more importance are its on-road capabilities. Basically, the Disco 3 is a big square box that swallows people and luggage. If you are looking for one, go for the seven-seat option. Even though you might not want that extra pew, the seven-seaters had air suspension as standard, which is excellent. The five-seaters did not. So what can go wrong? Well, the air suspension I've just highly recommended can spring a leak. So look out for a warning light on the dash or the car sitting unevenly when it's parked. Discoveries sadly are a favourite choice of car thieves, so make sure you have a vehicle history check before you buy. And so to my final car, the Audi Q7. Your £7,000 budget will buy you an early 2007 model. And boy, oh boy, do you get a lot of car. It feels incredibly wide. Measure the garage before you buy one. In the very back, there's 775 litres of space available if you fold the third row of seats down. But if you want those seats up, then you still get a pretty useful 330 litres. So if space is your big thing, this is the one to go for. Like the XC90, the Series 1 Q7 was offered with a bewildering selection of engines over its eight-year life. However, when it was launched, the choice was a 345 BHP petrol or a 230 diesel. And no prizes for guessing which was the most popular. In fact, you might squeeze 30 mpg out of the diesel with a delicate right foot. Of the three, it is most like a saloon car to drive. It's nicely refined, it's comfortable and it's very well built. Are you now interested in a Q7? If so, here's what you need to know before shelling out. 
you're going to buy a car the size of Texas, then expect some whopping bills. It's not unusual for a Q7 to go through a set of tyres every 6,000 miles. Servicing can be another hard hit. Handle with care, and the car's variable servicing schedule might grant you 19,000 miles before the spanner light comes on. However, aggressive driving or lots of stop-start journeys could halve this. And as with all 4x4s, there is a chance that the car will have gone off-road, so get it up onto a ramp and check for abuse. Added together, these cars, when new, would have cost more than £120,000, but now I could acquire the whole lot for £20,000. But what if I had to choose just one? Volvo. To me, the XC90's somewhat old-world charm, ruggedness and relatively compact dimensions give this car a slight 4x4 advantage. Earlier in the show, Tiff and Jason introduced us to two new super saloons and are on a mission to find out which is best. Nice work if you can get it. However, not everyone has 60 to 70,000 pounds burning a hole in their pocket. So, what are the choices if you want a car with similar performance but for less than a fifth of the price? How about these three for starters? I reckon these are among the best used performance saloons for around 10 grand. The BMW M5. The Mercedes E55 AMG and the Audi RS6. Together, you are looking at over 1,300 brake horsepower of German muscle. <sighs> Delicious. Each brilliantly packages practicality, performance and style. So, let's get into the detail. If you're going to single out three second-hand super saloons worth paying attention to, then one of them has got to have an M badge on its rear. This E60 version was made from 2005 to 2010. At £66,000, it wasn't cheap, but you certainly weren't shortchanged on power because its V10 motor puts out 507 brake horsepower, enough to propel it to 62 miles an hour in 4.7 seconds. Its top speed is officially limited to 155 miles an hour, but you can get that limiter taken off, in which case this bruiser of a machine will go on to 200 miles an hour and beyond. And in fact, at one stage, it was the world's fastest saloon car. The chassis is wonderful, the engine is phenomenal. If you want to pootle around, it's very comfortable, but if you want to put your foot down and have some fun, it will do that big time. So, if you fancy one, what must you look out for? The hardware that makes up the seven-speed automatic gearbox is sturdy enough, but the software can become glitchy. A reset can solve the problem, but occasionally a complete shutdown will occur, costing you £6,000. A red cog warning light on the dashboard is the first sign of a second mortgage. Stopping a car that weighs almost two tonnes and goes like a rocket eats brakes. And a new set of pads and discs will set you back around £2,000, so check them carefully. The M5 can be an assault on your senses, but don't worry, you will have time to collect your thoughts at the petrol station. Expect around 16 mpg if driven carefully. Next, the Mercedes. From one iconic tuning division to another, AMG. Now, there's a hand-built engine under the bonnet with a fantastic voice. Just listen. And you would be forgiven for buying this car on that alone. These W211 models were built between 2003 and 2006. They have 469 brake horsepower, which gives this car an identical 0 to 62 time as the BMW, 4.7 seconds. But top speed here is 180. It's not as athletic as the M5 to drive, and it hasn't quite got that terrific steering feel, but you have got oodles and oodles of torque, and if you want a car to smoke tyres in, this is the one. So what can go wrong? The 
E55 has self-leveling air suspension and a pump to keep that air going. However, the airbags can develop leaks and therefore overwork the pump and then the pump can fail. Now, to check your system, leave the car overnight and in the morning, see if any of the corners have dropped more than the others. And there's another pump-related problem. Mercedes cars of this era have a clever pump that maintains an even pressure in the brake line. Now, in early models, this could fail after two to 300,000 presses, so make sure that your car has had that rectified in the recall. And finally, the Audi RS6. This model, made between 2002 and 2004, is the oldest car here, but that's because that RS badge is so desirable, you have to go back a bit further to get one for around 10 grand. Rapid acceleration and slow depreciation means this has to be one of the options. Under my right foot is 444 brake horsepower generated from a 4.2-litre V8 twin-turbo engine. Does it sound as good as the AMG? No. The Audi has considerably less power than the Merc or BMW, but weighs about the same. And yet it gets to 62 in exactly the same time. Is this a sleight of hand, you ask? No, it is simple maths. Like most Audis, this RS6 has got four-wheel drive, and the more wheels you've got putting the power down, the more grip you've got, and everything that the engine can give you goes down onto the tarmac. The suspension is more taut than in the other two, so it doesn't quite give that relaxed comfort. And also, it lacks that intimacy that the rear-wheel drive cars can give you. However, it is a phenomenal straight-line monster. What to look for? Well, a tow hook, for starters. Hauling a caravan around will heat up the oil in the engine and transmission systems, and RS6s don't like that. Would you like to know the cost of an engine replacement? No, you don't. And the intercoolers can leak, and if the leak is big enough, then the turbos can fail, and that's another bill you don't want to know about. If you bought all of these cars new all together about 13 to 15 years ago, then they would have set you back the thick end of £200,000. Today, you can buy all three for less than half the price of the Alpha Quadrifoglio Jason's been driving. Which one do I want to get? This one. Why? Well, I've always had a soft spot for the M badge. For me, it's a combination of performance and handling that is a pretty perfect package. Earlier in the show, the Fifth Gear team tested the new Ford Fiesta ST, and there's no doubt it impressed. Great fun. I can't believe it's a 1500cc engine. Nevertheless, it still costs 20 grand. What if you only have a quarter of that? Can you still find something that's compact, quick and fun? Yes, I think you can. Take these three, for example. A Clio Renault Sport 182 Trophy, a Series 2 Mini Cooper S, and a Skoda Fabia VRS. All these speedy runabouts are now available with sensible miles and less than 13 years old for under five grand. I'll start with the Clio. I'm actually driving a bit of a collector's item because only 550 of these 182 trophies were ever made. The 182 Trophy, which went on sale in 2005, was dreamt up to clear out old stock. Renault took the standard 182 Clio, so-called because it had 182 horsepower, slapped on some fancy wheels, special paint and a numbered plaque, and hoped its rarity would justify the hefty 15 and a half grand price tag. In fact, Renault's marketing department was so uninterested in this car that they didn't bother keeping an example. So, I bet they were mightily surprised when Autocar got hold of one and declared it the world's greatest hot hatch. Why? Well, because Renault quietly fitted the trophy with some of the world's most trick suspension components, a set of Saks race engineering dampers. They cost a fortune and transformed a great car into an outstanding one. So, if you want one, what must you watch out for? 
Well, first, check those precious sax dampers as the piston rods can corrode. Yes, they can be rebuilt, but if all four need some work, then it's going to add up. Cars like this are often abused, and the gearbox can be the first thing to go. If the gear lever moves under acceleration and deceleration, it's a sign that the mounts have gone. Car number two. An item about second-hand super minis really has to include a mini, and now £5,000 will comfortably get you into a second-generation Cooper S. The R56 model was launched in 2007, and although it looks very similar to the Series 1, it was in fact brand new from the bottom up. Engine, bodywork, the lot. And this Cooper S got its extra power from a more efficient turbocharger rather than the previous supercharger. The result is 172 brake horsepower from a 1.6 litre engine and 0-62 in 7.1 seconds. Which is no different to the 0-62 type of the Clio. But what is different is the feeling inside the cabin. This car is made by BMW and boy can you tell, the fit and finish is fantastic. So what can go wrong? First up, check the clutch is working properly. These minis have a dual mass flywheel for smooth changes. If things go wrong, they can cost up to £1,000 to fix. And the brake discs can corrode if the car isn't driven for a long time. To replace these plus pads will cost you a little over £500. My final car is a bit of a sleeper. Now, you don't think about Skoda when you think about super minis, but they're rather very good at making them. And Skoda came up with a rather unusual way of getting performance from the power plant. Because the engine is boosted by a turbocharger and a supercharger. Turbochargers deliver lots of power, but are slow to react when you plant the throttle. Superchargers react instantly. However, they sap power from the engine. Combining smaller versions of both maximises the benefits while minimising the drawbacks. When you put your foot down, you really do get that sense of power. There's no slacking throughout the rev range. They have done a very good job. So, what can go wrong with the VRS? Now, listen carefully, because this is very serious. Early versions had a CAVE-coded engine, C-A-V-E, and they had serious piston and oil feed problems, resulting in about a third of them having engine failure. A film of oil around the exhaust is the first warning sign. For peace of mind, get a later car with a CHTE engine in it. They were fitted in 2012 and cured all the problems. And there's a sticker inside the driver's door to let you know which engine is fitted. So, three great super minis that won't break the bank. And now I have to pick my favourite. It is a really tough call. My head says those two, but my heart, which I'm going to be led by, says Cleo. It's the most enjoyable all-round drive.